William Styron wrote in his book, Darkness Visible, that one of the hardest things to endure when you're in a severe depression, and I can vouch for this, is the inability of language to get across to other people the, the full extent of what you're facing. Um, <clears throat> to the point where you get frustrated and you sort of think, well, they're facing it too, but they're just in denial. They don't want to hear what I have to say because they know that it's true um, and that they can't refute it. And that scares the hell out of them. So language kind of is problematic when you're trying to discuss things like this. When you're trying to discuss what existential panic or existential fear is. And you're horrified by the idea of existence. Um, and that added to my near psychotic depression. Uh, the fact that I felt so utterly cut off from people and it was almost as though it was a sort of deliberately cut off because people were ostracizing me because I alone knew the truth type thing. That, that kind of feeling was going through my mind. <clears throat> and a lot of people who are severely depressed will tell you the same thing. It's this idea that other people are just living in an illusion, that they're in denial. They don't want to see the truth for what it is, and in a way, who can blame them? Um, now, I agree with, in, in a strange sense, that's a correct point of view, because the world might not be the way that we think that it is, or we say it is, and it might be a lot more profound than we think it is. In other words, if I look around me in my working class suburban neighborhood, uh, I just, I don't know most of my neighbors, but I assume that their lives are fairly structured and ordered based on the predictable um, middle class, lower middle class North American mode of life. Um, work, weekend, weekend events, um, meet up with family members during the week, uh, church maybe. Canadians not nowhere near as religious as Americans, but I think a little more religious than Europeans. Um, <clears throat> you know, this sort of thing, just a very structured life. A uh, very structured life based upon the idea that there is a proper way to live, and that if you live properly, everything will turn out okay. Now, I can understand why somebody would want to cling to that. Uh, why somebody would not want to hear what a depressed person has to say about it all. Um, to the point where people will block you out if you try to explain that there is a different way of seeing this. They'll just say, oh, you're sick, there's something wrong, etc. Now, I, I'll be the first to admit that depression kind of is a pathological state, but I would say that the depression itself is a pathological state that points to something. It's not that the depression is wrong or a delusion or whatever. I would say that it's sort of um, a fear-based reaction to seeing reality for what it is. You see reality for what it is, and in some sense you revolt against it that you don't want reality to be this way. <clears throat> well, reality is. It is the way that it is. My input isn't required. I don't need to, or it doesn't need me to approve of what reality actually is. Necessity is necessity, right? What is going to happen is going to happen. Um, as I say, I in the free will determinism thing, I'm kind of a, more of a compatibilist. And... Um, or I, agnostic even, I can't make up my mind, and it seems badly framed dichotomy anyway, but a lot of stuff is determined, right? That's necessity. Um, your facticity, you can't do anything about what is. And that's what makes it necessity, is the fact that you can't do anything about it. Um, so if reality is a certain way, it kind of doesn't do us any good to not face it. Because what happens is, you understand that reality is a certain way, but you just pray that you don't get the short end of the stick. I think that's the root of all 
blind faith. You'll do anything to convince yourself that things are not this way. And that's what creates the great illusion of mythologies and um, distractions and anchorings and all that sort of thing. You'll do anything to keep your mind off the fact that reality at bottom might not be anywhere near as pleasant as what you think it is. But, again, that just creates an inner angst. It doesn't mean that the depression, the anxiety, the angst, the panic and everything is the absolute reality. Because the depression and the angst is taking place in here. It's taking place inside of me, right? It's not taking place outside in the world. The world just is. It doesn't, uh, the, the universe doesn't feel anything as far as I know or reality itself or necessity itself doesn't feel anything. And I think that that's what terrifies so many people about necessity, about facticity, about the universe, the physical universe. It doesn't care. Well, okay, it doesn't care. It doesn't care one way or the other. Um, like I always say, in uh, the, the, the great mistake made by Walter Kurtz in Apocalypse Now is he thought the jungle was horror and death and despair and terror and savagery. No, the jungle is neutral. All these things take place in the jungle, yes, but the jungle doesn't think anything of it. It doesn't approve or disapprove of the savageries that take place in it. Uh, it's impassive. Um, in fact, the movie implied that Walter Kurtz was kind of an abomination to the jungle because the jungle was being misrepresented by Walter Kurtz. Um, the jungle wasn't particularly evil or anything. It wasn't particularly good. It just was. So the horrors and everything that we see when we perceive reality for what it is, in other words, Zappi's cavemen, are in us. They're in us. They're not out there in the thing called the phenomenal universe. Um, <clears throat> so you might be afraid of facing the knowledge of it, of what reality really is, of what things are really like once you take the bite out of the tree of knowledge or the apple that you picked off the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. You might not, you might be terrified by what's out there. But remember, what's out there is not necessarily terrifying. You're, you are terrified. The fact that you are terrified doesn't mean that what is out there is terrifying, right? Um, but it can feel that way because you don't, you don't, um, your emotions can't distinguish things that way in the same way that your rational mind can. Your emotions can have weird combinations, like your emotions can team up with your intellect to have the phenomenon, say, of mad geniuses, where the guy can, you know, a, a mad scientist can solve the most complicated mathematical problems and have an absolutely brilliant technical mind and ability to build all kinds of fascinating things or discover fascinating things. Um, but emotionally and psychologically, he's an absolute wreck of a human being. Okay, it's not an unknown phenomenon because the emotions are sort of running riot and the intellectual side of that person's character isn't even paying attention to that fact. Um, the mind doesn't seem to be capable of distinguishing between its emotional, intuitive, psychological aspect and its rational, mental, um, analytical aspect. The two are m m meshed together. You know, you, you imagine, say, a, a character like Hitler being like that. Um, extremely sharp intellect, razor sharp, but mad as a hatter. You know, his emotions are uh, taken over to a point where he doesn't grasp that they've taken over. Um, and there's that inner conflict and inner terror and all this sort of thing. <clears throat> the inner chaos. What if you could, in some sense, merge the two? You, you're, as I say, your, your intellectual mind, your analytical mind can lead you to some pretty horrible dis uh, conclusions about life, about um, 
reality, this sort of thing, because the conclusions that you draw bear no relation to the way people live around you, because people around you live in a in a kind of a matrix-like state, right? Um, <clears throat> and they seem to want to. Uh, they seem to actually get a little bit upset when you even mention the fact that we might be living in a matrix. Why? Because of that fear again, the fear that they can't acknowledge. Um, but what happens, though, for those of us who actually seek out that fear and try to understand it? What, a, what, a, what, about, the, what about those of us who seek to actually get a glimpse of what killed Zapfi's caveman? What about those of us who actually seek to understand what it's like to live in a state of emotional disintegration, like severe depression or existential panic? We want to know what that is, what, it, what it's like. Um, we want to understand it the better to deal with it if and when it arrives. In other words, I want to know what existential panic is, because the next time I have an existential panic attack, and again, words, whew, you can't even describe what existential panic attack is. It's quite literally the worst thing in the world. It's room 101. I can't imagine anything being worse than that. Um, and I mean anything worse than existential panic. It's just, it's the sum of all fears, as I say. Um, <clears throat> let's you know, say that you kind of know that you're heading in this general direction, you can inoculate yourself against it. You can sort of say, okay, I'm going to sort of exercise my faculties to deal with the fact that there's a crisis ahead. Like if I knew that um, I was going to be in uh, a sort of desert island kind of scenario inside of a couple of years, I would prepare myself for it. I'd get used to living for a long period of time in, in as much as it's, it's possible without food, without, you know, with minimal water, or I'd discover how I could assimilate seawater and what things are edible and all this sort of thing. And I can prepare for this disaster, this great trial that's going to happen. Same thing with existential panic or just existential angst or facing reality. You can sort of figure out how to deal with it by slowly abandoning all the props that other people live by because those props are actually dangerous in in your view of things because they blind you to what is going to happen or what what it's like when you actually see reality what if you actually seek out that horror the better to understand it the better to prepare for it the better to deal with it you're seeking out a horror inside of yourself right you're trying to find something that's in there and it's a, the horror is inside of you, and it's a reaction to what's outside of you. You have an internal horror, which is a reaction to an exterior reality. Okay, now, um, philosophy is pretty dry stuff, or it can be. And the, one of the reasons why I'm drawn to Nietzsche is because he, more than any other philosopher I know, um, brings some sort of life into it all. He points your face directly at it and said, see, 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 this is the, this is the experiential stuff. This isn't just you musing about things intellectually, about people in general. This is happening to you, Mr. Human Being Individual. Um, <clears throat> you, where the actual fear is, the terror is, the love and the hate. Not, not in the abstract, but the actual experience of these things, the first person experience of all your emotions and all your thoughts and how these two interact with each other. And <clears throat> he talks in uh, you know, a lot of really dry, complicated, mind-wrenching uh, grammatical stuff, um, uh, turns of phrase, uh, stuff like that that sort of wrench your mind. But interspersed with it is a great deal of, I won't say appeals to, to, to emotion. I would say um, appeals to us to admit that this stuff causes emotion in us. Um, like, take the idea of eternal recurrence. Now, Here's a quote from um, The Will to Power, which was inside a, uh, 
unfinished book on returnal, eternal recurrence. My philosophy brings the triumphant idea of which all other modes of thought will ultimately perish. So this is the idea that will kill all the other, way, all the other ways of thinking. It is the great cultivating idea. The races that cannot bear it stand condemned. Those who find it the greatest benefit are chosen to rule. Now think about that. Think about what that might mean. Eh? Think about what Hitler could do with that. Um, but it's not what it seems, of course. Um, I want to teach the idea that gives many the right to erase themselves, the great cultivating idea, the right to erase themselves. Everything becomes and recurs eternally. Escape is impossible. Supposing we could judge value, what follows? The idea of recurrence as a selective principle in the service of strength and barbarism to endure the idea of the recurrence one needs. Freedom from morality, new means against the fact of pain. Pain conceived as a tool, as the father of pleasure. But think about that. New means against the fact of pain. The enjoyment of all kinds of uncertainty, experimentalism as a counterweight to this extreme fatalism. Abolition of the concept of necessity. Abolition of the will. Abolition of knowledge in itself. Greatest elevation of the consciousness of strength in man as he creates the overman. Now what I, you know, here's a hint towards what the overman might mean in a certain context. Somebody who has such strength that he or she can deal with what reality actually is, the overman. Um, and that'll tell you something about what strength is, what the strength you need to, to do well in this world, to survive and flourish in this world. Not to say I want to get out of here, it's a, oh, I like it here. How can you make yourself into that kind of a person? Um, a doer, a person who has enthusiasm, curiosity, that likes uncertainty, that likes being kind of half in the dark, that like, likes not knowing what new horror is going to fly out of the monster's mouth right at him. It's just another challenge, another, um, another obstacle that is just part of existence that you might as well just use as a piece in a game. Uh, eventually, you are going to lose the game that you're playing, but playing the game is the fun part. Remember when you were a kid, you tended to not even think about whether or not you were winning a game or whatever. It was more you were playing the game as an end in itself. So you have means, we have means of strengthening ourselves. You can meditate on what reality is. You don't have to meditate on ideals. You can meditate on absolute realism. Um, and he's got, Nietzsche's got another interesting thing, which I've dealt with before. It's called Amor Fati, or um, uh, he just emphasizes love. Now, very few philosophers do this, talking about love. It just seems to be the antithesis of, the, of what philosophy should be. Philosophy, philosophy should be as neutral as possible, according to a lot of people, which, yes, I understand that. But our reaction to philosophy can't be neutral, can it? We have needs, we have fears, we have desires. We can't be neutral when it comes to um, philosophy, to anything. It's not in our nature to be neutral like this. Um, and what seems to actually be the deciding factor here is love. If you, if you have to ha have plus or minuses in terms of your desires, if you have to have loves, hates, fears, um, antipathies, uh, addictions, attractions, repulsions, all this sort of thing, which one do you really want to cultivate? Because, again, the emotions are taking place inside of you. You have control over them. Um, they might be involuntary when they happen, but you can actually, you know, if you follow the stoic um, regime, as it were, of building your character, uh, you can cultivate certain things. 
when when the feelings arise, it's not necessarily voluntary. But if you build your character along certain lines, it might become vol. It might still remain involuntary. But what's more likely to happen is what is already you've already sort of put inside yourself type thing. I think psychotherapy works this way. Um, <clears throat> and what do you what do you want to put inside yourself in order to feel involuntarily as necessity hits you in the face? Well, Nietzsche again. True, we love life not because we are used to living, but because we are used to loving. There is always some madness in love, but there is always some reason in madness. Reason in madness, what does that mean? Well, if you're feeling a certain irrational emotion, and let's face it, love is not rational, or it's not fully rational, um, let's say you're feeling love, then why are you feeling it? Well, because it does seem to be the healthiest and the most conducive emotion out there to actually deal with, or the, the best emotion to use against all of our fears, right? If you love life, it's because you love, and that fear is not the uppermost thing in your mind. You, you consciously attempt to use love against your fears. Again, I don't want to get into this, uh, but the type of practice that I follow is based upon exactly that. You use love against that which horrifies you the most. Um, I visited the Kali Temple in Calcutta, Kali Ghat, a few months back. A mess. Animals being beheaded everywhere. You're walking around barefoot and filth and slime and everything. Um, and it's all taking place before the image of this ferocious goddess. Why the hell would anyone do this? This madness, the absolute antithesis of everything that we think of when we think of stereotypical Zen-like or Om-type Hinduism. Well, that's the point, isn't it? We live in a universe where all these things happen. Why pretend that it doesn't? Why sit over there and chant Hare Krishna and pretend like none of this stuff is going on, that everything is just you know, la, 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 la? No, 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 no. Look at reality. What do you make of it? <laughs> Pretty awful, eh? No, it's not awful. It just is. You have made it awful. You have imposed awfulness onto it. It just is. How do you fix it? Love. Now, I'm not going to get it go any further into it than that. Uh, I prefer to sort of remain in the context of Western thought th for this. But Nietzsche does seem to point in exactly that direction. Love what reality is, as opposed to fearing it. What is the antidote to fear? Love. Well, how can you love something like getting shoved into a gas chamber at Auschwitz? How stupid is that? Okay, then hate it and see what happens. Fear it and see what happens. That's your choice. You can say, oh yeah, how, it, I, I can't imagine anything more idiotic than loving, loving the fact that I've just been tied to a stake and about, I'm about to be burned as a witch in uh, medieval Brussels or something like that. How, how, what kind of lunatic would love that? Well, maybe the lunatic who doesn't have any other bloody choice. <laughs> you know, you think you're in control of the fact that an angry mob has just tied you up and is about to burn you at the stake? I think that it's fair to say that if you ever end up in that situation, this has happened out of your control, out of your ability to influence it. So if you can't influence it, why are you afraid? It's going to happen. Here it comes. You know, take your pick. And the, you know, the other objection to that is, of course, that's impossible. You can't do that. I would say you can't. I would say it's near impossible, perhaps, yes. But it's also near impossible to think your way out of the matrix, if you ask me. To suddenly become fully aware and fully apprehensive of the fact that we live in kind of an illusion. What are the odds against you coming to that realization? What are the odds against you just walking out your front door one day and you get Zapfi's moment of existential panic. 
Just bang, out of, out of the blue. What are the odds of that? Gazillion to one. Okay, same odds as coming to love that that's going to happen to you. You know, you have to sort of put these things together as a whole. You have to say, okay, this is necessity. This is going to happen. This is the reality of the situation. It's going to happen. This is necessity, right? This is your facticity. And facticity isn't just what's behind you. It's what, what's ahead of you, too. Um, as I say, I, most people's perception of time works backwards. They, they, they sort of live their life by looking back into the past to make sense out of the future and, and assuming that the present is, or sorry, the future is going to be like the past. Well, the past is just a mythology to most people, and it's not actually what, a, what, what actually happened. Um, you know, you think about, say, the 1960s, the summer of love, all this sort of thing. This is 20 years after we discovered that Auschwitz had happened, and most of the people who had fought in the Second World War were probably still alive, and they were, they were probably looking at the young kids dancing around with flowers in their hair going, these people don't know what the world really is. That's their problem. We can't fault them for it, but they're absolutely blind. Well, yes and no. They may be absolutely blind, but a lot of them... Uh, became hippies after having seen the same horror in Vietnam. They made a choice. What am I going to do? Am I going to be destroyed by this, or am I going to use it to make myself into a better person? And a better person, not in terms of how other people see me, but how I actually am when I'm living my own existence. <clears throat> Necessity is going to happen. Now what? What do I do? Do I hate it? Do I push necessity away? You can't. That's what necessity is, that which is out of your control. You cannot push it away. It's going to happen. Now what? Love. Um, a lot of people think that my take on Nietzsche is pretty much the craziest one of a particularly crazy philosopher. I see him as a prophet of love. I see him as, uh, I, won't, I won't say a saintly person, but he um, points to a way where one can see the world through I, what looks suspiciously like the, eye, the eyes of a saint. Love for everything. Amor fati. Where you want nothing to be different in your life. You want it to be exactly the way it is. You want your existence, your fate, to be what it is, whatever it is. It's, you know, I guess it's kind of like... Um, the existentialist radical openness to life. Um, now, this can be cultivated. You can be open to life, even though you can't change what life is. You can be open to it, or you can be push. You can be the sort of person that pushes it away. Now, this is again. This is this is the horror that you're facing. Now, what does that do to all the good stuff in life? How does that sharpen your enjoyment of all the other stuff? Okay, maybe you're not going to enjoy McDonald's hamburger as much. Because you know that that kind of represents the garbage that we're all being fed, right? Not by anyone. We're being fed the garbage by each other, basically. There's nobody up there controlling the herd. The herd is sort of self-policing. The Walmart, McDonald's, um, 7-Eleven life um, with professional sports thrown in there, nice easy chair in front of the TV set, etc. That's not what I refer to as the pleasures of life. What I mean is actual existential joy, I suppose. The joy at simply existing, if you want that. Um, and again, Nietzsche says that's not just, that's not just a, a wonderful life to live. He says his formula for greatness is amor fati. Love of necessity, love of fate. All idealism is mendacity is self-delusion in the face of what is necessary. So forget all the ideals. All crap not for you. In fact, it's poisonous for the individual, the true individual. Um, but love, a certain type of love, not the, ac the acquisitive type of love where you love something, but you love existence. You love fate. And again, you, you understand what fate really means, right? You understand what necessity really means. It's something you cannot evade. It's going to happen. Why would you not cultivate this? 
Why would you not want to do this? Um, I can't imagine any other thing that is more erroneous than that, more of a true error, um, a more pathological state than hatred of existence. Um, and I would say to such a person who hates existence, okay, go on and keep hating it and see how far it gets you. Just keep going, keep hating, keep pushing it away, keep suppressing it, keep denying it, keep doing all of that sort of thing. Just fill your boots, do your best to deal with fate this way. Eventually, you're going to come to the realization that uh, I did, I think, 30 years ago. Um, it doesn't matter. My input in the exterior world is not required. What's required or what is important to me, I think, or what actually seems to be the most vital thing from my point of view, from my perspective, because I'm living in all of this, is my reaction to everything um, or my assessment of everything. I can like it or I can lump it. Which one is going to make me into a greater person? Not a good person, but a person of greatness. I would assume it has to be love. Um, because I can see people who are driven and to the absolute heights, and they don't strike me as particularly great people. In fact, they strike me as losers. Um, obvious example, Hitler. Sorry, that guy was a loser. He almost controlled the world. He was a loser. Um, no love in him. Uh, not love for humanity. Not love for Ava Brown. But love of existence. Um, and again, how do I know what he was actually feeling? But you know what I mean. If The traditional image that we have of him. Um, somebody who was a great person? You might not even know. The Ubermensch might be living next door to me. How do I know? Um, which one do you want to be? You know, which one is more conducive to health? Uh, it seems pretty darned obvious which one it is. But again, I'm not going to try and stop somebody for, for plumbing the horrors of existence. Um, strange as it may say, if someone is still down there and still in the pit of horror, it's because they haven't reached the bottom. Uh, I may never even have reached the bottom, even when I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I could barely speak. I was that depressed. Um, but I know what I felt there. You never get over that. <laughs> you never really get past it. Uh, but you can get through it, and you can strengthen yourself from it. You can use, as Nietzsche says, suffering as a tool. Uh, a tool to, tool to inculcate what? Well, a tool to inculcate love. Um, and you've got to be careful what you mean by love. Um, not huggy, huggy love, and I love everybody, like that nauseating character from uh, The Family Guy with the southern accent. Uh, I'm talking about love of existence itself, love of the worst things in existence as well as the best things in existence, or love of the fact that existence contains the good and the bad in itself. Um, I would say that that kind of thinking is probably was probably central to me pulling myself out of the depression that I was in. Things just are. Now what? 